Hello, my name is Stuart, and I'm a blacksmith. I work at an amusement park in North Jersey called Wild West City. This is an authentic blacksmith shop that's similar to blacksmith shops from the 1800s. Now, what do I do here? What I do is I can make anything out of metal. I heat it up, pull it out of the fire, and I can hammer it to any shape I want. Now, this is a follow-up of a discussion that I had on a website called iForge Iron, in which I tell people how to bend things using bending forks that fit in a vise. Now, in my discussions, I told people that if you bend a piece of half inch round into a U and leave enough space in there, we're hot half inch round, so it should be a little more than half inch, will fit in there. This works perfectly in a vise for bending things. What's the advantage of this? You don't leave hammer marks because you're not hitting the piece of metal, you're twisting it. So I'm going to lock it in this vise. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bend a chain link. Now, to bend a chain link, what I do is I put it between the forks and I pull it around. Now, if the bend is too big, because the forks are close together, I can adjust this. I can bend this right around into a chain link as I keep adjusting it to make sure that everything is square. There we go. That's half the link. I'm going to open it up a little more. As you can see, I'm not pounding on it, so I'm not leaving flat spots or hammer marks. I'm going to put it back in the fire. What I did was I heated up the other end of the link. I'm ready to bend that around. So just like I bent the first side, I heat this up, pull it out of the fire, put it between the forks, and bend it around. Now, it's bent too much in one spot, so I pull it back and I correct it. And I pull it around again. That's almost done. All I have to do is give it a couple little taps. And I have a chain link. I'm going to open up that a little more. There we go. Here we go. I have a nice, symmetrical, clean looking chain link. Now, I'm going to flatten it out a little bit. So that lays flat. Voila, one chain link. Now, if you look at that chain over there, you'll see I bend one after another, and they're all the same size. They're all flat, and they all look like this. Now, in this particular piece, I use rebar just as an example to show how I bend. Now, you can bend anything that way. If you want to do fancy scroll work, you can bend it using bending forks, just like I did. You don't have to beat the living daylights out of it over the horn of an anvil, because that leaves flat sparks, spots and hammer marks. And clean work, and the way Europeans work, is they don't leave hammer marks on their work. They forge to finish. The less grinding you do on work, the better. And that's how the professionals do it in Europe. And that's how I was trained. Now traditionally Americans will bend a link over the horn of the anvil to get the right curve. But when you hit hot metal, you flatten it out number one, and number two you leave hammer marks. Using bending force like I just did, you don't leave any hammer marks. Now, these bending force that I used, as you can see, simple. It's just bent around, and like I told everybody in the uh, written lecture I gave, the distance between the two forks should be slightly larger than the material, so that when it's hot, it fits in there. See, it expands when you heat it, so you don't want it too tight in there, but you don't want to loose in there, because you want to be able to tighten up your bends, like I did on that chain link. Now, bigger material 
calls for bigger bending force. This is five eighths round rather than three quarter round. So the gap's a little bigger and the material's a little bigger. And these are made to bend five eighths round to three quarter round. The bigger the forks, the bigger the material you can bend. But you still want to keep the distance between the two forks tight so that you can adjust, adjust your bends and make them exactly the way you want to make them. Yes, I served an apprenticeship for five years in a European blacksmith shop. And in European shops, they forge to finish, meaning they do as little grinding as possible. That's why they taught me how to use bending forks to do bending rather than do it over the edge of an anvil or over the horn. Now, I have a 14-year-old apprentice who I'm teaching blacksmithing. And after a few hours of lessons, he forged this bowie knife. And as you can see, there's a minimum of hammer marks where he ground it. Minimum of hammer marks means that you can finish the knife a lot quicker, and it's a much cleaner job. That's what I mean by forging to finish. Now, the European philosophy is to do clean work. Uh, a lot of people think that leaving hammer marks in their work shows that a, a blacksmith did it. If you did that in Europe, they would call you a shoemaker and they tell you to hit the bricks, that you don't have the talent to do this kind of work. So, hammer marks are bad and clean work is good. Now, I teach blacksmithing at Wild West City on weekends. I take on students and I give lessons on how to do clean forging. I show people how to, uh, how to hammer, how to bend, how to do all the different aspects of blacksmith work. I was fortunate to have served an apprenticeship in a shop where they really knew what they were doing. In five years, I was never called a shoemaker. Shoemaker is the worst insult that a blacksmith can give you because shoemakers, back in the day, used to huff glue all day while gluing soles and heels to shoes. And that caused brain damage. So it's the biggest insult that you can get. Uh, anybody who I teach will not be a shoemaker. They'll be a blacksmith.